All right. Three, two, one. Let's dance. Hello and welcome, everyone. I'm Corey Hofstein, and this is Flirting with Models, the podcast that pulls back the curtain to discover the human factor behind the quantitative strategy. Corey Hofstein is the co-founder and chief investment officer of Newfound Research. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Newfound Research's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Newfound Research. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Newfound Research may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. For more information, visit thinknewfound.com. If you enjoy this podcast, we'd greatly appreciate it if you could leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast platform. And check out our sponsor. This season, it's, well, it's me. People ask me all the time, Corey, what do you actually do? Well, back in 2008, I co-founded Newfound Research. We're a quantitative investment and research firm dedicated to helping investors proactively navigate the risks of investing through more holistic diversification. Whether through the funds we manage, the exchange-traded products we power, or the total portfolio solutions we construct, like the Structural Alpha Model Portfolio Series, we offer a variety of solutions to financial advisors and institutions. Check us out at www.thinknewfound.com. And now on with the show. Today I speak with David Sun, a retail trader who started his own hedge fund. Coming from a non-traditional background, David takes a non-traditional approach in his investment mandates. Focused on selling options to capture the volatility risk premium, David believes that markets are ultimately efficient and therefore foregoes using any sort of active signal. Instead, he focuses on explicitly controlling his win size relative to his loss size, and then choosing a strategy with a win rate that bumps him into positive expectancy. By then maximizing the number of at-bats, he lets the central limit theorem take care of the rest. It's an approach he calls expectancy hacking. We discuss this approach in both theory and practice, addressing issues such as trading costs and slippage drag, as well as both sequence and event risk. David's approach is certainly non-traditional, but highlights some unique concepts of how traders may be able to architect a payoff profile around a risk premium. Please enjoy my conversation with David Sun. David Sun, welcome to the program. This is going to be a fun little episode. I think most of my listeners are used to Flirting with Models being a podcast where we try to get folks who are experienced industry professionals. But last season, I had Darren Johnson on, who is a retail trader, very professional still, but not doing investing for other people, trading his own money. You are the Darren Johnson of this season, I think, coming at the world of investing from a very non-traditional approach, forging your own path, really excited to dive into some of the ways in which you've done this sort of in an unorthodox manner. So excited to get into it. So David, welcome. Why don't we start off with your background? Corey, first of all, been a longtime fan of the show, been following all the episodes, really enjoyed it been highly influential in my own trading. So I just want to say it's an honor and privilege to be a guest. So thank you for having me. As far as my background, like you mentioned, I don't have any formal finance pedigree or background formal education at all. In fact, my background's in electrical engineering. So how I got into options was when I was at grad school, this was around 2008, 2009. Of course, that's a period of time when the market's been on everyone's mind. So I somehow just decided, hey, I want to get in the stock market. And back then, my investment thesis was watch Mad Money, see what Jim Cramer mentions, buy those stocks. So totally uneducated. So I had a buddy at grad school who was in the options trading. So when he found out that I was trying to get into the market, he taught me basically and showed me about options. And interesting thing is he taught me options from the short premium side, selling options. I know most people who get into it more learn about options than from buying options, like at this lotto ticket kind of thing. So I learned it from the short side. And again, very unsophisticated back then. I didn't know a delta from a theta. My plan was sell monthly options on five different stocks. Again, probably ones that Jim Cramer mentioned. 
And I was like, okay, if I can get X amount per month, I just got to sell these and I'll make X percent a year. The ironic thing is that it worked for a couple of years. I doubled my account over two years or something. So it was working great. And then at some point it stopped working and the stocks I chose all tanked and then gave back a bunch. So I got a little bit disillusioned and it got out of the market. Coincidentally, because I took my money out to buy a house, my first house. But when I started my first job, this was my engineering job, my buddy there, he knew that I was still an option because I talked about it a little bit. And he was looking for ways to grow his money because he had some funds with some manager and he wasn't really happy with performance. So I did a lot of research, options, Tasty Trade came up. And as you guys, your audience may not know, Tasty Trade is this online financial, more retail oriented, educational financial network that has a whole bunch of content and really can be a huge source of knowledge, although sometimes a little too much, like drinking from a fire hose almost. But found that, and this was around 2017, and it really accelerated my learning curve. So I reignited my passion for options, got back and went head first, tried all kinds of stuff, learned everything, tried different strategies, and finally started making progress and getting better. Now, fast forward to mid-2018, this is actually only about a year later. I must have done a lot that year. I was getting more confident. And I don't know what got the idea in my head, but I was finding like, what if I'm successful doing this for myself? Can I do it for others? And again, I don't know how the idea of having a hedge fund came up, but I was like, let's launch a hedge fund. At that point, I had no idea what a hedge fund was. I was doing research on how to start one. I started my path to become an RIA, which obviously is not what I wanted to do. I started studying for my Series 6 and got the book and everything about the schedule of the test. And I stumbled upon a Facebook group for RIAs. And I just randomly posted. I was like, hey, I'm not sure I'm in the right place, but I'm actually trying to start a hedge fund instead of joining or starting a RIA firm. And coincidentally, somebody there in the group, he had been a hedge fund manager. And he had switched to the RIA side, but he kind of knew the industry and connected me with an accountant, the CPA, who ultimately I started working with. And he was like, okay, this is what you got to do. And that got me to the right service providers and everything. So basically launched my first hedge fund in late 2018. So ran that for, well, I'm still running that. And then actually started my second hedge fund in early 2021. And then fast forward to now. And here we are. We got connected sometime last year. And yeah, after hearing Darren's episode, especially that kind of intrigued me because your audience mostly has that institutional or professional tilt. But having somebody that was not the same kind of background, I was like, hey, it might be interesting for me to check it out, see if I can share some ideas, especially since my trajectory is also quite different. I always love the non-traditional path into finance because I think so much of what we believe philosophically comes from our backgrounds. So people perhaps who have unique backgrounds are able to see markets in a different way and have different ideas. And we're certainly going to explore that in this episode. Starting off, though, at a high level, can you describe the two mandates that you're managing and the core theses behind them? One of my funds basically takes a return stacking approach, which obviously that's a term you've done a lot of research on and ideas that you've delved into. And the idea is just to have a core portfolio, and this is a pure beta component. And that core can be whatever you want. I have a certain blend of index funds that I use, and let's call that the benchmark. And on top of that, I'm using various income strategies as an overlay to be sort of the alpha component. I think we spoke before, you call it a portable alpha, which is kind of an interesting term. So taking this overlay and just stacking on top of your core portfolio, the mandate is simply to outperform the core. So I've called my fund an enhanced index fund or enhanced beta, if you will. Almost a, well, in fact, it is a buy and hold combined with an active overlay. And that's the first approach. And then the second fund, which was the one we launched later, we stripped out one of our option strategies, which was a zero DTE strategy. And the unique fact about zero DTE, which stands for zero days to expiration, this intraday options with no overnight no risk because everything closes out by end of day. So this second fund is a pure 100% zero DTE approach. So the idea for that is just to generate a completely non-correlated return with very tight risk management, very low drawdowns, and just a pure alpha or absolute return approach. 
maybe to more fully round out the picture, can you describe from an implementation perspective how that zero DTE strategy works in practice? What are you trading? What are you looking for intraday? When are you trading intraday? How are you thinking about exiting positions? That sort of stuff. With zero DTE, we're trading 100% SPX index options because those are very liquid. It's a large notional product, so you actually get reasonable amount of premium, being that there's very little time decay left. So we're entering puts and calls. So entry is delta neutral. We don't have a bias. And we put a stop loss on to manage the risk. And we're entering multiple times throughout the day just to increase the number of occurrences. And with zero DTE, it used to be for a few years ago, from 2017 and onward, SPX had three times a week, so many occurrences a year. Now, recently, at SIBO, they released the Tuesday expirations, and then the Thursdays one's coming out next week. In fact, it just got listed today. So there's a large number of opportunities that we can have. And with multiple entries a day, we can have basically a larger opportunity set. And just to clarify, this is selling options again. So the goal is to harvest that time decay. What makes it unique, again, is that positions all close out by the end of the day. And the risk management we apply with just using a stop loss but that keeps the tail risk in check. We do have one other long option strategy as well, and that's more a tail risk or hedge because when you're talking about intraday, you can get pretty large moves and these intraday black swans that happen more often than you think because it's essentially a compressed time frame. So on certain days where you get this big rip, either up or down, we can flip to the long side and capture some of that convexity as well. But the main Distinction, again, is the fact that these are zero-dated options, meaning they expire that day, everything's going to go to cash, and we're basically flat by the end of the day. Now, this is where I think things get really interesting, because you describe this process to me as having absolutely no signal to it. You're not making entries and exits based on some sort of conditional market signal. You view it as a pure probabilistic play. I was hoping you could explain that to me. One thing I want to point out, this no signal approach, this is by choice. And when you say signals, what does that mean? People talking about some kind of moving average crossover or looking at RSI or something that gives you a feeling that you can predict direction. Now, for one, we aren't biased. Like I said, we entered delta neutral at entry. Now, it doesn't stay delta neutral depending on which way the market moves. But the idea is we're going to enter delta neutral no matter what the market's doing. Either it looks like it's trending or it doesn't look like it's trending, depending on volatility is, we're just going to enter the same number of entries every day. And it's basically like if you have a loaded die, you know that the odds are you're going to get one through four a certain percentage of the time. Let's say one through four is a win and five and six is a loss. You have a higher chance of the one through four. So we just want to roll the die as many times as possible. And again, with the higher frequency of expiration cycles now and the frequency at which we entry, we can get a few thousand occurrences on the same strategy in a given year. Because normally with longer data strategies, depending on the risk management and how long you're in trade, if you're in a position, enter 45 days, exit 21 days later, you're only going to get so many occurrences in a year. But with something like the zero data option, we get a huge number of occurrences and really let the central limit theorem and the law of large numbers, that can actually really play out. You described this in your own podcast that you host, as well as on a pre-call we had together, you described this idea as, quote, expectancy hacking. I thought was a unique way of phrasing what you're trying to accomplish with your approach. Can you expand on that idea? What is expectancy hacking? When we talk about expectancy or EV, it's basically a function of three things. Your win rate, your win size, and your loss size. And win size to loss size is basically risk-reward ratio. The thing is, I found, especially for newer traders, maybe even more experienced ones, a lot of people focus on the win rate. They want high win rate or they want a high hit rate. And there's various reasons for that, but everyone wants to win. No one likes the feeling of losing. And you just feel good about closing trades and putting wins on the board. But ultimately, if your losses are too big, it doesn't matter how high your win rate is, you're going to have negative expectancy. So if you apply rigid loss mitigation, and let's just use a simple example. 
if you have a trade where you're risking $2 to make $1, you lose two on a loss, you make one on a win. I'm not counting for slippage or fees or just perfect two to one. You're going to have about a 66.66% break even win rate. So if every three trades, you essentially win two and you lose one, you're going to net zero. If your win rate is above that, you'll be positive EV. If you're below that, you'll be negative. So the idea is using risk management, we're essentially fixing the win-loss ratio. You can never determine all three variables, but rather than focusing on trying to somehow fix the win rate, we fix the risk-reward ratio and then design or enter trades that have a probability of winning higher than that break-even win rate. That's what I call expectancy hacking. Again, you can't control all three variables, but if you can control two of the three, then your net profit, net expectancy is only determined by that one. Options are kind of a probabilistic instrument anyways. Generally speaking, lower delta equates to higher win rate. So if I have a stop loss at X level and I'm entering trades at 30 delta, 20 delta, 10 delta, now you got to test this out. But basically, the lower the delta, the higher the win rate, generally speaking. And at some point, if you go low enough, that win rate is going to peak above what you need for breakeven. And at that point, you've essentially, last time we spoke, you used the term architecture or architected this payoff profile. And that's what I mean by expectancy hacking. You're really focusing on two aspects of the expectancy equation that are easier to fix and can control, and then letting the cards fall where they will on that third variable, which is the win rate. So focusing on that win rate for a second, another key feature of your approach, you've called, quote, premium capture rate. And you've actually described as being the single most important factor to your approach. So again, I was hoping you could expand on what is premium capture rate and why do you consider it to be so important? We focus primarily on premium selling. So When you're talking about purely premium selling strategies or selling options, premium capture rate is synonymous with the expectancy. So the term should be fairly self-explanatory. It's the amount of premium you capture or net after accounting for all losses, for fees, commissions, slippage, whatever it is. So it's basically if I sell $1,000 in premium and at the end of the day, after all the trades, I've netted $250, that's a premium capture rate or PCR of 25%. And the reason that's important is because if you're running various strategies and try to compare metrics, it lets you compare strategies on an apples to apples basis. Now, there are some limitations, obviously, because you have to keep in mind different contexts. If you're comparing a super low delta strategy to a super high delta strategy, basically, you can't always expect the premium capture to be the same. And what I mean is, if you're doing a very high win rate strategy, you're probably getting not a lot of premium on an option because you're going far out in the wings. Now, you might have a high PCR, but that P&L in absolute terms may not be greater than if you went and sold a at-the-money strategy, a straddle, and you were able to capture 10%. Because a high PCR of a smaller pool premium may not be more in absolute terms than a low PCR of a huge pool premium. So you just have to be aware of the context when comparing. So it may not make sense to compare the PCR of a really high delta to a really low delta strategy. But as long as you're in that same regime, it lets you have a normalized factor and it gives you something to shoot for. If I know that based on the testing, I want to capture, let's just do 25% as an example. That's like my golden standard. And as I'm live trading or forward testing, it lets you gauge, am I above or below my typical expectancy on a strategy. I want to talk a minute away from the theoretical and more towards the practical, because when you trade in options, you're trading in a instrument that has much wider spreads than, say, something like cash equities. So we have this theoretical concept of the win rate, the win size, the loss size. You're trying to fix two and then choose a strategy such that the third bumps you into positive expectancy. But the actual implementation realities are going to move that win size and loss size potentially off of target. So how do you account for things like spreads and slippage in your premium calculations? And how do you try to minimize them 
from an implementation risk perspective? From the calculation standpoint, you just bake it into your math. I use the example of a perfect two to one risk reward is going to have a certain break even win rate. With slippage, your loss might become more like 2.2 or 2.3. All that's going to do is shift what's required to break even. It's basically going to pull all of the EVs down. So it's not that you can really do anything about the math. It is what it is. Obviously, you have to hit a higher win rate, so to speak, to get the same premium capture after you counted for the slippage. But from an implementation standpoint, that's one reason why we basically only trade SPX index options. Because liquidity, you want to focus on a liquid instrument to minimize the slippage. On the other hand, we don't use market orders anymore because depending on market conditions, it can be wide, you have really bad slippage. So you can use algorithmic orders that improve the execution. You can use various limit orders, even uh, interactive brokers. I don't know if that's more concerned retail or professional, but they have technology and execution algorithms that anyone can use that are available that can help with execution. And that's one way to minimize the slippage. Just be smarter about getting a good fill. Basically, you just got to bake it into the math. I've heard about stop orders and options, and there's always the warning of, okay, never use stops, never do this, options are illiquid, this won't work. Well, it won't work perfectly, but it's just about understanding okay, how do they work? (laughs) And then taking what you know and just applying that to the system and just adapting. That's really our approach. Maybe you can dive into that component a bit more because it seems like a huge part of your process is fixing that loss size, which depends on stops. And stops can have potential problems. I'm thinking in my head, potentially like situations where you're selling deeper out of the money option. And as you're losing, it should be increasing in delta, that may be a scenario where it's adverse for you to potentially close the position, or perhaps it actually goes in your favor. I'm curious as to your experience with those stop losses. Do you risk gaps? Do you risk having to cross the spread more aggressively to close out the position, which increases the loss size? How does that actually play out in practice? Let's talk about zero DTE first. Zero DTE is intraday strategies. So there is no gap because we're out of the market once the market's closed. So the flip side is there's no gap in zero DT, but there's gamma. So things move a lot faster. And to account for that really is just if you have a fairly tight stop, you can get out or hopefully try to get out before the gamma really picks up or the volatility or the vega really hits you. In fact, if you ever look at the option chain, and these are defined by the SIBO rulebook, but the spreads are actually wider when the option price itself is wider. And there's certain limitations they have to quote the bid ask spread. So if you're getting into a trade at a dollar and you're getting out of it at two to three dollars, or you're still in that regime. So the spread is consistent and it's not too bad. But if you let it trade balloon to like ten dollars and you're getting out five or six X and the spread's even wider, obviously that's not good. But mainly with zero DTE gap risk presumably is not present. And again, if you apply the execution algos that help with execution and give that better price, then that can keep you safe. Now, for the non-zero DTE, this is why I've recently moved out my longer data strategies more into the 90 DTE regime. Because when you're far out there, that gamma curve is a lot flatter. So like you said, your delta is increasing as it moves against you, but it's moving a lot slower. Not only that, at further durations, the true impact of Vega is a little bit more muted as well. So it's not going to hit you as hard as you may think just based on what your brokerage platform shows in terms of the nominal Vega. And even the live trading I've done, I've been trading through COVID and everything. And the back tests I've done, if I'm trying to limit my losses at 2x, for example, now under normal circumstances, it might be 2.0, 2.03 with the slippage. In COVID, with the gaps even, I think the worst we saw was 3.3, 3.4. So like an extra multiple, but it's manageable. And again, that's also something you just have to work into. Right? Because if you have a perfect two point whatever, your numbers are going to show your average loss is going to be whatever that number is. But on a longer dated study, including those gaps that occasionally happen, right, that's going to bump it up a little bit. But again, you have so many occurrences that more or less, they're not going to skew things too much. The premiums you would be collecting at, say, when VIX is 15 versus 
when VIX is something like 50 are going to be really different. And there might be this path conditional situation where you're more likely to lose when VIX is 50 than when VIX is 15. Curious how you deal with the sequence risk nature of the strategy. This is the other really key factor to expectancy hacking. Expectancy hacking, we talked about just fixing the risk reward ratio. But if you're, let's say, selling at a fixed delta, when VIX is higher, you're going to get more premium. And if you looked at a lot of these backtest studies, it's not necessarily that the win rate's going to change. Because if you believe in efficient markets and delta as a proxy for probability, you should get fairly similar win rates across all market regimes at a certain delta. However, if you just happen to lose the larger trade, you collected a boatload of credit and high VIX and you lost that one and you only won the small ones, that's going to have a terrible impact. It's going to completely skew the probabilities. And like I said, that sequencing risk. Now, you could have it the other way around where you win the big ones, lose the small ones, but we don't want to consider that because that's just luck. This was precisely because during COVID, when we were trading, we were collecting a lot larger credits and we thought we were safe because we could stay at the same deltas we're used to, but we would just take these huge losses sometimes on a stop. So this idea of credit targeting really was born from the experience of trading through that market. So the idea behind credit targeting is I want to equalize the amount of premium I collect for every trade. People know you should be consistent with sizing, but traditionally sizing has been purely in contract sizing or maybe in buying power because the capital is equalized. But for me, because the losses are determined by my stop, which means that there are multiple of the credit, which means my credit is really the proxy for my risk. So if I'm trying to collect $1,000 on a trade, you can collect two contracts at $500 or 10 contracts at $100. You're still going to get that 1000 Now, for various reasons, if it's that extreme, again, you don't want to take too much leverage by going too crazy on a contract size. But generally speaking, that idea of fixing the credit, that is what ultimately is going to minimize that sequence risk because that's going to fix that risk-reward ratio. What's interesting is with premium selling or people who learn options, because volatility is such a big component, we've been taught high volatility is opportunity. High volatility is when you scale in. And I used to do this. It didn't work that well in COVID. Again, I learned so many lessons. And not that it can't work. If you have the bankroll and the buying power to manage losses and to wait things out, you can take advantage of the high volatility. But because of the mechanics that I use of hard stops, they basically don't fit with that kind of approach because you get stopped out and you're done. You're out of the trade. You took a big loss. So by fixing that credit, it lets you really smooth out that sequence risk and it makes each size truly equal size. And one interesting aspect is when you have high credit, if you're trying to target a fixed amount, that actually lets you in a higher IV environment, you can go down in contract size to collect the same amount of premium or you can go down in delta, or both. So the way I look at it is, what happens is, I look at high volatility, not as an opportunity to make more, but as an opportunity to make the same, but hopefully with less risk, because I can scale down, I can size down, I can go further out in money. So that's a byproduct of this idea of credit targeting as well. So you're very explicitly targeting this expected return and backing out the trade size necessary sort of asymptotically approach that expectation over time. But it strikes me that by locking in the expected return, in many ways, you're letting the risk vary. And I'm reminded of this idea of risk ignition by Aaron Brown, who's the ex-chief risk officer at AQR. And the idea of risk ignition is that when you take too little risk, you're ultimately failing to maximize the opportunity in front of you. And if you take too much risk, you're going to blow yourself up. So given that you are sort of locking in the expected return and letting risk vary to a certain degree in these different environments, at least based on how much leverage you're taking on, how do you know what expected return to target? Is 5% safe? Is 10% safe? Why not go for 20? Just to clarify, because I might have skimmed over a bit, when you're referring to backing things out, the point is when we're approaching designing a system, or sizing the trade, we take this top-down approach. Typically, people take a bottom-up approach where they're looking for different opportunities and different positions and different trades. 
and then they put them on and then they manage them. And at the end of the day, you have all these opportunities, you manage the risk. And there's always this phrase, make as much as you can or take what the market gives you. Now, ultimately, all of us take what the market gives us. But when I say a top down approach, using the PCR, and again, let's use 25%, this gives us a top down approach where there's a million dollar portfolio, I want to make 10%, which is 100,000. If I know I expect to capture 25% of the premium, then I should sell 400,000 because I'm going to capture 25, which is 100,000. So I have 400,000 of premium to sell. Then backing that out, I just take the 400,000, divide that by the number of trades I'm going to do in a given period of time, let's say a year. And that gives you that credit target. So the idea of having the tool of the credit target lets you take a very high level top-down approach and take your end goal and back that all the way to the one step that you got to do over and over. Now, that gives you the approach, the goal. But what should the goal be? That's your question. So a lot of people talk about backtesting and backtesting is a tool. Sometimes one of the criticisms of backtesting is for one, past performance is an indication of future returns. And of course, just because it worked in the past doesn't mean it work in the future. But backtesting gives you context. And when I do backtests, I have a reasonable expectation to hit my target. But what's the path? What I'm getting at is the drawdown. So the way I build my test is usually I'll have some dynamic user input. So all the trades are there, but I can flip the target 5%, 10%, whatever it is. And that's going to dynamically scale all the trades and it's going to compound based on the net lick of every single day. And it's going to scale dynamically. And I can look at the equity curve and I'm looking at the max drawdown, max drawdown over the entire period of time, max drawdown over any given year. And you can just play with that. And essentially, at that point, it's up to the individual trader. If your risk tolerance is X, and if you look at, oh, I can target 20% return with X percent drawdown, if that's within your tolerance, that's the first step. I say that's the first step because the thing is with risk tolerance, I have a saying that you usually don't find your risk tolerance. It will find you because you always think you can tolerate X drawdown. But at some point, it's always going to surprise you. But at least having this kind of approach gives you a guidepost and lets you know where to set your initial guardrails. But then once you run it, having that live feedback, but that's the start. We look at the risk adjusted return and what kind of drawdown do you expect based on a certain target return that you're going to set for the whole system. How do you think about fair compensation for risk? Because you might be setting the expected return, but it's possible that your risk adjusted return is high during periods that you are selling when vol is expensive and quite low when you're systematically selling cheap vol without any signal. Why is this ultimately better than an approach where we're just naively long other positive expected return asset classes like stocks or bonds? So there's a few angles which I want to talk about this because you talk about fair compensation for risk and quote unquote cheap of all. What is cheap? Cheap relative to what? And if you believe in efficient markets, you would imagine that risk is actually priced in. Now, when we go forward, if the implied volatility is higher or lower than the realized volatility, no one can really predict that. So if RV is higher than IV, then the vol was cheap in hindsight, and the opposite is true. First of all, if you believe in VRP, volatility risk premium, and that edge of selling options, that has to be the fundamental thesis behind why we sell vol in the first place. And you can craft different strategies with short options, long options, but at the end of the day, they're just different ways to try and harvest out that risk premium. So you just need to use your risk management because there's risk in theory versus risk in practice. If I sell a dollar in premium on this high leverage product or high notional, people talk about max loss. Oh, you're going to risk 30000 or 40000 whatever it is, to make 100 bucks. That's a hugely negatively skewed risk reward profile. But that's risk in theory. Number one, is this stock or this index going to go to zero? What is actually your chance of getting the $40,000 max loss? It's zero. I mean, it should be pretty close to that, especially with an index. Now, if you don't use risk management, then what is the probability of X amount of loss? And that's just based on the probability distribution. But beyond that, we are using 
very tight risk management. So this is why it comes back to, I say that we're defining our own risk. The risk in theory is not the same as risk in practice. So I do believe with the proper risk management, you can achieve stronger risk-adjusted return. And again, when you talk about risk-adjusted return, like what is the risk? We look at more like the risk in practice, the actual risk that we plan to take. In the context of our risk management, we're able to harvest out that little bit of edge. Nobody knows how much actual edge there is at any one time. And again, that's all in hindsight. But it's because you apply the risk management that you can extract that edge in quote unquote safe manner. So whether or not it's cheap or not cheap, that's not really something we look at. We just look at, okay, if we do this trade and these probabilities hold up, we can have this expectancy show up. Let's keep diving into the risk side of the equation. The other thing that immediately jumps to mind for me, particularly in this market environment that we're in in 2022, is event risk. There are very particular days on the calendar that typically represent higher event risks, things like elections or FOMC meetings, certain economic data prints. How do you think about zero DT strategies on those days versus, say, non-event days where maybe the tail risks might not be as great? This comes back to at least my belief in efficient markets and how everything is priced in. On FOMC days, for example, and this is kind of timely because I actually just went back and updated some of our research on our success rate on FOMC days. FOMC days are basically intraday binary events because they have the speech at 2 p.m. or they release the minutes. So there's always something going on like once a month. And for one, you'll see options hold their price until 2 p.m. The theta is just a lot slower. So on those days, the intraday IV is higher. You're going to be able to get further out of the money for the same amount of credit. And conversely, you can't scale in as aggressively because essentially this time comes to a standstill. Everyone's waiting for that event. So to that extent, I think that's priced in. So having said that, again, we just take the approach of just play the odds and let the occurrences come out. And from a tail risk perspective, we have tight risk management anyways. So that's basically from an implementation standpoint, really, we don't see any major change on those event days because we're going to have those risk mitigation components in place regardless. And again, I mentioned this is timely because and this may be some recency bias, but we always thought about, okay, if these are particularly volatile days and it always felt like we're actually not winning, it's always a loss on the FOMC days. Like, should we go back and just skip those days or do something different on those days? And I finally pulled out our backtest log and our live trade log and just looked at those event days, the days when they do the speeches or the days where they release the minutes. And it looked like the win rate was slightly lower but it wasn't enough to compel me to skip them. Because again, the way we constructed our risk reward profile, if that win rate's above the break even, you're going to make money. This was done kind of quickly. But again, looking at the numbers, it just didn't really compel me. And this is another instance of, you can almost think of it as a signal. Oh, okay, FOMC days, event days, I'm going to skip this trade or do this or do this differently. So I know a lot of people, when you don't look at data, it's easy to have that bias. And even the last, I think, two or three FOMC days, we did have a losing day. So like that recency bias kicks in. And that's when we start going, oh, should we skip this or is there more risk? But really, we want to be data led. So we looked at the data and like right now, I'm just not compelled to do anything different necessarily. Another very common risk management technique, probably the first that many people turn to because it's the lowest hanging fruit would be diversification. And you have made the explicit choice only to run these approaches on the S&P 500 index using SPX options. Why not expand the basket? Why not trade this on multiple indices or multiple underlying stocks where you could get even more at-bats? When it comes specifically to zero DTE, the main reason is because SMP or SPX has the most number of expirations, especially now with the five days a week coming up. So the most amount of opportunities and liquidity. And one thing I touched on earlier with that, we're doing zero DTE. There's not a lot of time left. So the premium with respect to the notional size of the product actually is quite small. So it is a leverage strategy. Because of that, a smaller product is going to have 
relatively speaking, maybe the same amount of premium. But when you don't have that kind of scale, basically fixed costs come into play. If it takes SPX, a 4000 price product to get $100 of premium, then there's going to be the cost of buying your wings to spread off the wrist, there's commission, there's a slippage, all of those are basically fixed costs. So when you have a smaller product, from a proportional standpoint, the probabilities may be the same, but once you add the fixed costs, that's going to basically depress your expectancy because those fixed costs basically trump everything else. So with zero DD specifically, it's just SPX has the most number of opportunities and it has the product size that makes the trade actually work at scale. Now from longer tenor strategies, like with the 90 DTE, I'm not opposed to looking at other products. But for the research I've done and everything that's evolved with our strategies up until now, it's been focused on that product because it's something we knew. And number one, the liquidity. I've done some research into trying to get some uncorrelated underlines, like applying those to TLT or USO or some commodity ETFs. For one, I think the fact that they also don't have the same number of expiration cycles. Like even with SPY right now, you're going to get a good amount every month. And then once it comes closer, there's the weeklies and everything. So having less expirations, it doesn't allow me to spread out that sequence risk because we talked about the credit targeting with entries. But if I'm trying to enter daily, for example, and there's only one expiration a month, and let's say my preference is to enter at 90 DTE, What's going to happen is if there's only a monthly expiration, I'm going to enter at 90, but then 89, 80, 80, all the way down to like 60 before the next one comes out. So you get a lot of positions basically concentrated on the same expiration cycle. So that introduces a degree of sequencing risk as well. So there's some constraints just as far as the opportunity set. Liquidity is one issue. SPY, that's probably the most liquid ETF there is to trade. And liquidity is a huge factor. We talked about slippage and using stops and everything. But again, I'm not opposed to it. It's just I haven't had the time to find something that works the same. But I think that principle of diversification, it makes sense. And that's something I'm going to continue to explore. Who knows, one day I may be running this on multiple underlines. We spent most of this chat so far talking about the zero DTE strategy. You've mentioned the longer dated 90 DTE Obviously, those two approaches are going to have very different risk factors. The most obvious that comes to mind is your zero DTE is going to be heavily tilted towards gamma versus a lot more vega in your 90 DTE. Curious, what other risk factor differences are there between the mandates and how does that ultimately affect strategy design? I think that really just comes down to the sizing. So with the fund I mentioned, which is return stacking, the beta of the whole strategy is already going to be basically one plus because you have the beta of the core plus the beta of the option strategies itself. Whereas with the zero DT, it's going to be more of a pure alpha approach. So we can lean more heavily into the option strategy itself. Again, looking at the sizing in the context with what is your end goal and what is construction of the overall portfolio? Because again, with the return stacking approach, we're taking mostly the US index ETFs. But you could build a core portfolio of whatever you want. You could have a mix of bonds, mix of commodities, or whatever it is, and that can be your core. But that's going to come with a different risk profile. So if you chose a core that's going to be less volatile, you may have the latitude to step it up in the sizing on the option strategy on that side. So really, it's just the overall risk profile and the deviation of returns that is within the risk tolerance. For me, sizing itself really is a mechanic. A lot of people don't really think about sizing as a mechanic, but I've come to think of it, that's what it all comes down to. Sizing is the mechanic that really lets you steer the path to a degree. We can never control the exact path, but with the sizing, with the credit targeting, minimizing sequence risk, that gives us some hand in kind of steering the path that we take to the end goal. I want to come back full circle to the introduction and your background. You discussed how you've had to navigate your way as an outsider into figuring out how to launch your own fund. I was wondering if there are any lessons you could share for other individuals who come from non-traditional backgrounds that are interested in launching their own hedge fund. For me, one thing that was surprising was it's not necessarily that hard to start a fund, the startup costs and getting the service providers. You can do an incubator fund, for example, which is one where you establish an entity 
for purposes of just having a track record, but you don't have any outside investors. And once you do the full launch, you're going to have your overhead and you can take outside investors. Actually starting it up as a business isn't necessarily the hardest thing to do or the most expensive thing. What's going to be a lot harder than you think is raising enough capital to sustain your overhead or even make a living. Because depending on the fee structure you do, you're going to have to hit a certain threshold as far as the AUM. So I think it's having realistic expectations. I probably should have done this more, but maybe asking around in your sphere, depending on who you're going to try to gather assets from, getting pre-commitments or something so you have an expectation of what you're going to start with. The other thing is, depending on your audience, because for me, our investor base right now is still basically 100% retail. We don't have the scale for really institutional investors. So that audience base, they're going to perceive what you do and how you explain your strategies differently. So if you're primarily presenting to a lay audience, what they prioritize and what they want to know and don't want to know is going to be very different. I would imagine if you're trying to pitch to an institutional allocator, they're going to do a lot of due diligence. They want to turn every stone over and know where the risk is exactly and everything, every single little detail. But lay audiences, they're not really going to be able to understand that anyways. So ironically, what it really comes down is just they just want to be confident in you as a person and that you're intelligent and understand what you're doing. It's almost more like the human side of it almost is more of a factor. It's know your audience and know how to play to that in terms of when you're trying to showcase what you're doing. Because I spent a lot of time in the beginning, had a lot of, I thought was kind of dumbed down PowerPoints and graphs and everything. And a lot of that really just went away. And it was more just talking about high level, what's my thesis, what's my outlook, what's my investment philosophy, rather than the deltas and the thetas and, and everything. Those two things were, I think, two things that I learned as I went on my path, because I don't think I really had enough AUM to even cover my expenses for the first two years. Again, maybe I was a little naive in the way I started so suddenly, and I just ripped the bandaid off when I was like, because I did an incubator. And I was like, you know what? I'd rather have a live track record with a little bit of investors than having a longer track record with no investors. For someone that just felt different for me, I don't know if that's true or not, but it was just different to have actual outside capital, even if it was a little bit. Well, David, we come to the end of the episode here. And the question I'm asking everyone at the end of this season is to reflect back upon your career so far and just think about what was the luckiest break in your career that you've had? I think the luckiest break I had in my career, and if you're talking about specifically the trajectory with launching a hedge fund and the progress with that really was the timing of market conditions. And this was pure luck. If you remember, I said I started in 2018, Q4. That was not a good quarter to really be doing anything with volatility because we had that really large drawdown. So I went out the gate with a large drawdown, but it recovered in 2019. And 2019 was a fairly quote unquote easy year. So I was able to immediately redeem myself. Like, okay, these strategies actually do work. So 2019 ended up being a good year in terms of performance. And then 2020 came. That was, of course, the monster of all black swans because I was in the market, so to speak, during 2008, but not really actively engaged. I was just dipping my toes in. So having that experience of 2020 and having gone through 2018, I had already tightened up my risk management a little bit because of that experience. But 2020, was more lessons learned, more adjustments to the strategy. And then somehow by a miracle, 2020 ended up being a fairly good year as well. And then 2021, and then now 2022. So the fact that I was able to learn those lessons at the right time, because if I had started right in 2020, or didn't have that experience of 2018, I could easily have maybe gone a little too big or didn't respect the risk as much. So I don't know if that's the answer people want to hear because that's not something you can really teach. It's just having the dumb luck of that timing. Everything worked out to teach me just enough so I learned from it, but not hard enough lesson where I couldn't recover from a big drawdown or whatever. Well, that's precisely the point of the question. Is It's what's the dumb luck that when we reflect upon ended up being some of the best parts of our career. So 
David, thank you so much for joining me. This has been a fantastic episode. Really enjoyed getting to hear sort of your very non-traditional approach to attacking these markets. And I think there was a lot of great stuff to come out of it. So thank you. Thanks again for having me.